Good afternoon, Professor Walter Williams. <clears throat> Good afternoon, Clemson Brown. It is wonderful to be here in your very beautiful home in Chicago, July 16, 2009, to continue a series of interviews that we began years ago. Um, Professor Williams, I'd like to open today by asking you, what is the first thing humanity should be taught about themselves to help them understand their humanity and the oneness with the universe that they have? Well, the first thing, uh, Brother Clemson, that any human of any race, creed, or color should be taught is something about their own personal humanity. And once they know something about their own personal humanity, then uh, all of humanity will be served better because of the understanding of what they know about themselves as a human being. Let me break that down a little further. Every human that's walking this earth, no matter what race, creed, or color that they may be, um, has a mother and a father that was used as human instruments to bring forth them and all of humanity into this world that we know today. This is what should be taught to the individual child as that child develop in age. Um, they should be taught that coming from their mother's womb, they were attached to uh, her umbilical cord. And the doctor, at the time of their birth, cut that umbilical cord to separate them from their mother, thereby beginning for them at that point, life independently was now in progress for that individual human being. When that life surge began to move about in their being, in their essence, uh, that is the spiritual power that they were given by the use of their mother and father as human instruments to bring them forth in this world. Now, mind you, the spiritual power that they were given is called their personal divine spiritual birthright. That's their birthright. It has nothing to do with the religion. This is what you're supposed to teach your child. It has nothing to do with the religion. So in other words, every human born on earth was given this spiritual power, which is called their personal divine spiritual birthright, but never was given a religion. Religion, all religions, are man-made, created by man. It has nothing to do with the human being. It's nothing to do with the creation of the human being. Mm -hmm. So the human being should know something about their own personal uh, power, which is their life, and know something about um, how they got here by their parents being used as human instruments. And they also should know and be taught that every human has a uh, invisible umbilical cord. And that invisible umbilical cord is called the pineal gland, which is a sensor organ that sits in the middle of your brain. It serves as a receiver and a sender by you receiving messages from the universe and sending messages from the universe. In other words, it's a conduit. And the bottom of your pineal gland are your nostrils. What do you do with your nostrils? You take intake air. You take in air to keep that spirit alive inside of you and keep you in constant consciousness as long as you live as a human being. Now, this consciousness via the, your pineal gland sets up for the human being their own personal universe because you as a uni as, 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 as a uh, as a human being living on earth uh, 
you are connected via your pineal gland with the universe, with your personal universe, with the cosmic universe, the larger cosmic spiritual universe, which has no beginning and no ending. Mm -hmm. Okay? Um, now, if I cut your head open, I can see your brains, but I cannot see your mind. Mm -hmm. Your mind is invisible spirit. That's your personal universe. Mm -hmm. You see? Um, if you know how to uh, use your personal universe, which you're using it every day, whether you realize it or not, mm -hmm. um, that personal consciousness coming from your personal awareness uh, by way of consciousness, spiritual consciousness, creates for you, the human being, your own personal life. Mm -hmm. This is your life that you create with inside of your spiritual consciousness, with inside of your universe, your personal universe. Now, one has to also be taught that there are close to seven billion other human beings walking this earth mm -hmm. of all races, creeds, and color. Everybody is trying to do the same thing, breathe in air and keep themselves alive. Mm -hmm. They too have their own personal universe. So therefore, the number of people walking this earth of all races, creeds, and color, uh, which is close to seven billion, they also have their own personal universe that they're dealing with. So in other words, everything that you see around you was once invisible. Everything that you see around you was invisible at one time. But from the mind of either a male or female, come forth in physical form everything that you see around you, mm -hmm. okay? Now, uh, that individual are known, or human beings as an individual, are known as little creators, mm -hmm. okay? Now, we as little creators, male and female, mm -hmm. can create and, and have created everything that you see around you in its physical form, except for the sky, the stars, the moon, the sun, air, water, earth, vegetation, uh, animals, and humanity, okay? A man and a woman singularly cannot create anything with life in it. Because as you look around, you'll see the things coming out of their minds, but it has no life to it. Mm -hmm. See? It has no life. The life comes when the two, the male and the female, have a, 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 a sexual union. And from that union comes procreation, comes life. But singularly, mm -hmm. by themselves, they cannot create anything with life in it other than that form of uh, togetherness to bring forth procreation. See, now, everyone is in consciousness as a human being. That means that if you're alive, you are conscious. And from that consciousness that, that you are aware of, everything that you learn or see or hear, or whatever the case might be, comes into your consciousness. Mm -hmm. From your consciousness goes into your subconsciousness. So your consciousness and your subconscious uh, mind are one and the same. Where are your subconscious mind? The subconscious mind is right here in your uh, stomach area. The same area where your mother incubated you for nine months. In other words, this is you're, 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 st you're storing information consciously and subconsciously. They work side by side or with each other. So these are the things that needs to be taught to the human being. And this every human should be taught that whatever they uh, make up their mind that they want to do 
or want to achieve, they can achieve it. All they have to do is uh, make up their mind because they are already automatically in contact with the universe, mm -hmm. like our ancestors, the ancient Egyptians. Um, they were in contact with the universe. The universe was their teacher. The universe taught them how to build the Great Pyramid, how to build the Great Springs, how to bring forth uh, all of uh, civilization from their culture uh, and giving it to and for the rest of the people living throughout the world. Okay? Every person living throughout the world today, no matter what race, creed, or color that they may be, are using uh, something from the culture of our ancestors, ancient Egyptians, because they were the first and oldest civilized people on planet Earth. Mm -hmm. So from that culture that they created over there in the continent of Africa, from that culture came civilization. And they were taught by the universe with uh, the connection that they had with their cosmic, in tune spiritual mind. And the universe taught them. So therefore, there's no other prior older civilization than the ancient Egyptians. So you can't say, well, the ancient Egyptians got this from another older civilization. No. The universe taught them. Okay? That's where you get the word university from because of the universe uh, teaching our ancestors, using them as human instruments, just like each human, their mother and father uh, are used as and were used as human instruments. Mm -hmm. uh, the same thing with the universe using our ancestors, the ancient Egyptians, as human instruments to bring forth all of civilization for all of humanity. This is what uh, an individual should be taught mm -hmm. as a child growing up, mm -hmm. as they modulate through the age uh, development of their life, then they should be taught this. And so they can not fall into pit uh, falls or the, or the traps of religion because any time an individual go to church and sit up in the pews of a church, he is giving all of his spiritual power away to a, a dead image on a cross called Jesus the Christ. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is what uh, has to be taught to the, to the human being because everything that a human need or needed at the time of their birthday was given it mm -hmm. spiritually. Mm -hmm. Everything that you need was given to you spiritually at the time of your birth. So you don't need a religion. Man created religion. You wasn't born with a religion. There's nothing on your birth certificate that says that you're a Christian. There's nothing on the birth certificate that says that you're Muslim or Jew or black Hebrew Israelite or Buddhist or Hindu, or etc., etc. Nothing on that that says that you are uh, and your humanity is tied up into any kind of religion. So these are the things that should be taught to the human being and, 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 and teach that human being that they could incubate their, their thoughts. And, and those thoughts will eventually, if they work, they have to work at it now. They just can't take in a thought and say, I want, a, I want a car. And then thinking that a car is going to appear at the curb for them. No, it's not going to do that. You have to take that thought into your uh, consciousness mind. Work it with your subconscious mind. It's going to do that automatically. And then you're going to have to uh, ideas because you have now uh, decided what you want to manifest in your life. Because like I mentioned before about your own personal universe. Mm -hmm. And from that uh, personal universe that you possess as a human being um, you can create your own world. So now, at this moment, you, you, as a human being, you are in need of a car, for instance. Okay? And then you decide what kind of car you want. And you begin to manifest and bring this car into your life, or a car into your life. But you have to do some work. You've got to follow your mind. 
your first mind. You've got to follow hunches. You've got to follow ideas that will pop in your, in your head of how you, the human being, can get uh, a car. So you have to teach uh, our uh, children how to use their, their own personal humanity by telling them and teaching them and developing uh, that uh, uh, ideology into their everyday life. Okay, So this is what has to be taught before you can teach anybody anything. It's about your own personal humanity. Who am I as a human being? So that's very, very key. And once they know who they are as a human being, then uh, development was, began to, to, to set in place. But, uh, but it's very detrimental to teach that child about a religion without uh, telling that child and teaching that child who they are as human beings. And if you know these things I'm talking about, then you, can, you won't ever need a religion because you wasn't born with a religion. You were born with an indwelling divine spiritual birthright. You were born with power of life, your personal power. Mm -hmm. And why give it away to any man-made religion? So this is uh, what has to be taught to humans throughout the world. Uh, Professor Williams, you mentioned the ancient Egyptians. Now, when, when you talk about the ancient Egyptians, I'm presuming that you're talking about uh, Nile Valley civilization. Uh, what, what are you talking about in terms of the, its territory and its people? Who, who are included in ancient Egyptian civilization? Okay, when you deal with the Nile Valley civilization, as it is known today, you're dealing with Ethiopia, the Sudan, Egypt, and from the Sudan came the Nubian out of Gondola in the Sudan. Mm -hmm. So today you got uh, four names that you're dealing with that made up what is known as the Nile Valley Civilization. You got the Ethiopians, the Sudanese, um, you got the Nubians, and, and you got the ancient Egyptians. All one and the same. Today they have separated those areas and renamed those areas to cause the confusion. But during the time of antiquity, which is ancient times, <clears throat> that whole area was considered and called the Nile Valley thereby producing a civilization coming from the Nile Valley uh, and called the Nile Valley Civilization. And the ancient Egyptians um, served as the foundation uh, for that Nile Valley Civilization. Uh, I always use the term uh, under one umbrella, uh, it was called the ancient Egyptian uh, commonwealth, divine commonwealth, mm -hmm. which was all under one umbrella. And today they call it the Nile Valley Civilization. What would be its territory boundaries? The boundaries would be uh, Ethiopia, uh, the Sudan, and of course Egypt. And then you got the countries across North Africa. All that was under the umbrella of the ancient Egyptian uh, divine commonwealth, which include Libya, Tunisia, Algeria, uh, Morocco, Mauritania, etc., etc. Now, would those have been black African people, or would they look similar to the uh, uh, Euro? Asian type that's there today? No, no, of course not. We're talking about the continent of Africa. Mm -hmm. Okay, we're talking about during the time of antiquity, ancient time. Mm -hmm. um, no Europeans, no known Europeans were in Africa during the time of antiquity. All Africans. Okay? Mm -hmm. Total Africans. Mm 
Mm -hmm. Black so, people. Well, if you want to use the term black, uh, I, 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 I call them Africans. So when you, when you use the term African or African, then you know that these people are Africans with dark skin. Mm -hmm. I don't use the term black, and I have a reason for that. But uh, Africans are dark-skinned people. Mm -hmm. I, I think, uh, uh, Professor Williams, that it's important uh, for our young people, especially uh, uh, African uh, young people, to understand what the contributions of ancient Egypt was. And as far as your research shows you, what was ancient Egypt like culturally and spiritually before Greek or European penetration? I want you to look at the, their value system, for an example, their educational system, uh, their, their politics, I mean, their technology. What is it that they bequeath to civilization? And if you want me to, I can break these questions up and uh, ask them to you one by one, but could you begin? Okay, the question is that what was ancient Egypt like before the, the Greeks and the Europeans came into Egypt? Mm -hmm. We're talking about a civilization beginning, let's say, 10,000 BC. Mm -hmm. um, the world's first and oldest civilized people on planet Earth, known to us today in history as the ancient Egyptians. There was no other prior older civilization than ancient Egypt. Mm -hmm. Okay, so one has to really understand that. So let's go inside of uh, ancient Egypt a little bit. Uh, at this time, um, like I mentioned before, that they were used as human instruments to bring forth all of civilization for the whole entire world. Mm -hmm. Meaning that everything that is used today, pen, paper, ink, um, furniture, uh, buildings, um, eating utensils, cosmetics, music, and you name it, they were the creators and inventors of these different uh, entities. Um, so, civilization was being built and structured and developed there. In other words, um, they brought forth animal husbandry, mm -hmm. domesticating the earth, domesticating animals, architecture, building the buildings, um, mathematics. They were the only people living on planet earth that were literate. And they were the only people by them um, lit, uh, have created mathematics as a uh, workable uh, discipline. Uh, they were able to build homes, houses, buildings, etc., etc. So they were the first people to live in and build homes or mm -hmm. houses or buildings mm -hmm. simply because they knew math. Mm -hmm. In order to build a house or building or whatever the case might be, you have to know mathematics. Mm -hmm. So without the knowledge of mathematics, you cannot build anything. So they were the creators of mathematics, all forms of math. Mm -hmm. um, so therefore, and they, uh, by them being uh, the first uh, to develop a writing system, mm -hmm. they had three forms of writing. One, the meta nature hieroglyphics, which has never, ever been deciphered. Mm -hmm. uh, and then they had the hieratic uh, demotic, cursive, phonetic script, which is the alphabet. Mm -hmm. And once an alphabet is created, it, it can only be created one time. That's it. So during the time of antiquity, our ancestors, ancient Egyptians, living in the continent of Africa, in Egypt, were the only literate people on planet Earth. Mm -hmm. No other race of people had a writing system. So therefore, they, they were illiterate. I'm not using that to degrade them. I'm just bringing out a fact. Mm -hmm. And if that fact is true, then it stands for itself. Okay? Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, that, uh, these things I have mentioned and have mentioned are part of the, the things that was going on there. Of course, you know, 
and the whole world know that they built the Great Pyramid, mm -hmm. which is still standing today. Mm -hmm. uh, they don't know how the Great Pyramid was built. It's a mystery. Mm -hmm. uh, they built the Sphinx, which the body of the Sphinx is uh, one city block long, six stories tall. Okay. In other words, they had uh, amazingly large mind, meaning that their thinking was big. Okay? There was nothing uh, to limit them. There was no uh, religion because uh, religion put you in bondage, put you into slave uh, servitude position. It limits your thinking, destroys your thinking. You can't think because all religions have rules uh, and laws and rituals and customs for one to abide by. So that limits the individual. The ancient Egyptians didn't have all of that. Mm -hmm. They had the underlying principles of mayat, mm -hmm. which is truth, justice, peace, love, and wisdom. This is what they had. This is the principle that they uh, governed themselves by, mm -hmm. you see. And um, the ancient Egyptians did not have armies. There was no army mm -hmm. in ancient Egypt, nor jails, because they had no corrupt government. Mm -hmm. Armies are used to uh, invade other people, take their land, take their culture, rape their women, mm -hmm. um, take their natural resources, uh, let's say, dominate them, colonize them. They, that wasn't even in their thinking. So therefore, they coexisted with all races of people as they came in contact with them throughout the world. So therefore, uh, they had no army, no jails, because their government was not corrupted. Mm -hmm. See, they didn't have a corrupt government. In order to have, uh, if, if you have a corrupt government, then that government needs jails to put people in because they're going to break the law. Mm -hmm. See, so they didn't have all that in ancient Egypt. See, so that they, they were spiritually free of all these uh, entanglements of uh, religion and uh, different other politics that was uh, based off of greed and et cetera, et cetera. See, now you take the European now, on the other hand, while we at this point in our interview, the European on the other hand, use the foundation of our ancestors, the ancient Egyptians, uh, to build themselves an institution on. This was done at the, at, at, after Alexander the Greek came into Egypt. But where, what period are we talking about? We're, talk, we're talking about 332 BC when Alexander the Greek came into Egypt. And, and how began, old at that time was the Egyptian, with the ancient Egyptian civilization? Over 9,000 years. So the ancient Egyptian civilization was 9,000 years old before the Europeans came before into Before the Egypt. Europeans ever set foot into Egypt and to the continent of Africa. Uh, they had a civilization that had been in existence for over 9,000 years. That's the ancient... Ancient Egypt. Egyptian. Well, You're talking about the world's what, first and only civiliz civilized people. What was happening in Europe uh, at that time 9,000 years ago? It is unknown simply because the Europeans will tell you, if you study European uh, history so far as trying to find the origin of it, they will tell you uh, that their beginning of origin uh, for themselves, the Europeans, is unknown. They start their beginning uh, history uh, with uh, the Greeks. This is, how the, this is what they start their beginning history with the Greeks. So uh, after coming into Egypt, you see, that's when their uh, European civilization really began. Then you can begin to document it now. 332 BC, when Alexander came into Egypt, that's the beginning of European uh, uh, history. Prior to that, they have tell you they don't know no origin, beginning history for themselves. They said that their history started with the Iliad and the Odyssey created by Homer. Now, there's never been a Homer, okay? Like there's never been Herodotus, there's never been uh, Euripides, there's never been. Pythagoras, uh, 
there's never been a, a Salon, there's never been a Socrates, or uh, Plato, or Aristotle, all of these names. Why do you say that? Because these are the names that Europeans use to ground and anchor their history. And you're saying they don't exist, but yet they have books, supposedly, that were written by these men. They put that out in their institutions during the time of the Second Renaissance period. The Second Renaissance period of Europe started in the 16th century. Mm -hmm. That's the age of learning. For the Europeans. For the Europeans. And in their institutions, they created what is known as history. The subject and the discipline known today as history was created right there. And it is, it is stated that whoever writes history controls history. So what they did, they put themselves into and created a pseudopigrapher history for themselves. The word pseudopigrapher means false and fictitious. Mm -hmm. So they created a, a, a Socrates. Uh, they created a Plato, they created an Aristotle, uh, with the Aristotle being the teacher of Alexander. And Alexander uh, built a, a library to house Aristotle's uh, many hundred books, hundreds of books that he was supposed to have written, which is all based off of a lie. And I can prove it, I'm going to prove it right in a, a few minutes, mm -hmm. a few seconds. Mm -hmm. uh, that was, they said that Herodotus was the father of uh, history. Mm -hmm. Okay, and they say that Euripides wrote Greek uh, tragedies. Mm -hmm. um, then they say um, uh, Hippocrates and um, Hippocrates and was the, uh, the father of medicine, etc., etc. And they say that Homer uh, wrote the Iliad and the Odyssey. Now, all of these names I just mentioned mm -hmm. are, are listed by way of a historical date, a supposed historical date, prior to the 4th century. Mm -hmm. See, most of these names are called a 5th century created characters in European uh, pseudopigrapher history, false and fictitious history, except for Homer, comes out of 9th century. So all of these names... Comes out of when? 9th century. 9th century? He was supposed to be 800, so that's the 9th century. Okay, that's B.C. B.C. Mm -hmm. So now, uh, I'm going to show you how uh, you get rid of these names and expose these names as being a lie. Mm -hmm. It's because the question that Walter Williams asked, if all of these names I've mentioned existed as human beings and not characters, then the question I ask is what alphabet was because the Greeks had no alphabet had no alphabet prior to coming into ancient Egypt. See? So what alphabet did they use? What alphabet did Socrates use? What alphabet did Plato use? What alphabet did Aristotle use to write so many hundreds of books? What alphabet did Euripides use to write Greek tragedies? What alphabet did Herodotus use to write history for the Europeans? What uh, alphabet did Homer use to write with? What alphabet did Pythagoras and uh, Hippocrates used, and Salon used to write with. They had none. See, so when, when the Greeks under Alexander, I'll tell you how, how a Greek alphabet was created. When the Greeks coming into Egypt under Alexander the Greek forced the Greek language on our ancestors, the ancient Egyptians, they applied, by them being a literate people, they applied an alphabet to that language. And the alphabet that they applied is a, is, is a phonetic alphabet because the phonetic alphabet was a very important, is a very important alphabet because you can, you can, you can write and put an alphabet, an alphabetical value to the sounds that you hear. Mm -hmm. You mm -hmm. see? So they learned the Greek language and began to apply an alphabet to the Greek language. Mm -hmm. So the, the Greek language had an alphabet applied to, but the Greeks had no alphabet because they were illiterate. The Greeks had no writing system? None whatsoever. They, they, they couldn't write? Couldn't read, couldn't write. If you, if you can't write, you can't read. So therefore, there's never been, during the time of antiquity now, ancient times, there was never an institution that ever came out of Greece. None whatsoever because they didn't have no writing system. Mm -hmm. You see?
Now, let me just ask you to digress for a moment in terms of the rest of Europe. Were the Greek civilization and culture any different from the rest of Europe? Uh, say, if you look or, uh, uh, into what today is England and Germany and uh, Scandinavia, was the Greek civilization the same as that civil uh, as those civilizations all uncivilized that's the same because today the europeans use greece and the greeks as a prototype civilization supposed civilization for all of europe so if the greeks was uncivilized and illiterate then all of europe was uncivilized and illiterate See? Can you give me any boundaries of Africa during ancient times, uh, just so we know what is encompassed in, ter in the territory of Africa, what we're talking about? I mean, uh, what was the boundaries of Africa? It's not the same today as it was in ancient times. It's not the same today because uh, the world has been remapped by the Europeans. Okay, but let's go back to ancient times. The map that is being used today to identify the whole continent of Africa, mm -hmm. <clears throat> let's take, for instance, use that map as a visual. Mm -hmm. Then, along with uh, that map, you go over in Northeast Africa, mm -hmm. and you come uh, to the country, and the countries that we know today as Turkey, mm -hmm. um, we know today as Saudi Arabia, mm -hmm. uh, Iraq, mm -hmm. Kuwait, mm -hmm. Iran, mm -hmm. Yemen, mm -hmm. uh, Syria, mm -hmm. uh, Lebanon, mm -hmm. and Israel. Well, I don't count Israel because that's an illegal state mm -hmm. that never supposed to have existed, but it's, it's there, so I, I, I ignore that. Mm -hmm. um, so, all of that area over there is considered Northeast Africa, misnomer today and called the Middle East. Mm -hmm. They made it the land of the Bible. That goes into another history. Mm -hmm. But if you take the, uh, the original uh, uh, map of, 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 of Africa and put all those other countries that I named, Turkey and Arabia and Yemen, and et cetera, et cetera, with that, that's the whole picture of Africa. The territory of Africa. The territory of Africa. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. You were talking about the Greeks having, the Europeans having no writing system and being uh, illiterate uh, people and that the Greeks, uh, the Africans, the ancient Egyptians applying uh, an alphabet, the phonetic script to their language. Please continue. Yeah, they, uh, so the, today as a misnomer, mm -hmm. people are taught that the Greeks had an alphabet. They never have no alphabet. That's a misnomer. And then from the Greek alphabet, they said, came the Latin. Mm -hmm. And then from the Greek and the Latin alphabet came uh, those, the Hebrew alphabet. There's no such thing as a Hebrew alphabet. Mm -hmm. All alphabets come from one source. And that's our ancestors, the ancient mm -hmm. Egyptians, mm -hmm. who lived in the continent of Africa. Mm -hmm. Okay? And, and, and so, so even the, uh, the, the, the Jewish religion uh, is now is claiming an alphabet with those large black calligraphied uh, letters that they use mm -hmm. to write what they call Hebrew. And prior to Hebrew coming in, they used those same calligraphied large black block letters to write Yiddish. Mm -hmm. you see. So uh, one has to know something about their, their relationship with the ancient Egyptians, uh, our ancestors. They have to know something about that. Mm -hmm. They don't, then the whole world um, can fool them. They can tell them anything, mm -hmm. you see. And uh, once uh, there was William A. Bennett, who used to be the Secretary of Education, said that to be ignorant of history is to be fundamentally uh, uh, like a child, mm -hmm. you see, because anybody can come and tell you anything. Mm -hmm. I want to draw your attention back to uh, these European writers that you were proving 
did not exist. Socrates and all of these, uh, Plato, all of these uh, supposedly ancient uh, European uh, personalities are fictitious. Can you continue uh, developing your your position on that? Well, I've said uh, just about everything that should be said to uh, to an individual's understanding about those names never existed. Those names are incarnated names. Mm -hmm. And how does one incarnate a name is that they create a name, mm -hmm. make a body for it, and put flesh on it. And how they make a body for it, after creating the name and putting flesh on that body, is by stories attached to it. They attach a story to it. Mm -hmm. And they put it in a book, teach it as part of the curriculum of a school system. Mm -hmm. They may put it in the Bible, mm -hmm. that, 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 that they teach people is the word of God and not to question it. Mm -hmm. And so they, they, they put these different incarnated names where uh, they will be exposed uh, to, the, to the minds of the, of, of the people throughout the world. And these names, such as Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, etc., etc., is no exception, you see? So they, these are incarnated names, they invented names, they write through these names. They say, oh, Socrates did so-and-so, so-and-so, so-and-so. And then they, 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 they would put a, a birth date for Socrates, a death date for Socrates, and then sometimes they even put uh, their mother's name or uh, the son of name or their father's or whatever the case might be to make it uh, real in the minds of the people. Now once an individual read and they believe that there was Socrates, mm -hmm. even though there's never been a human being walking this earth by the name of Socrates, but if the people who read this and have been taught that there was a Socrates, a Plato, who was Socrates supposed to be the teacher of Plato, Plato supposed to be the teacher of Aristotle, etc., etc., and Aristotle was supposed to have taught Alexander the Greek, and Alexander the Greek uh, built a, a library called the Great Library to house Aristotle's books. And if you, as long as you believe those stories, mm -hmm. then what the individual human being has done, they have created in their minds uh, and given life to Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, uh, and, and, and to Herodotus, and so forth and so on. You see, that's the, that's the key. And that's the reason why they have created these names to make, we're talking about the Europeans, create these names and put it into their curriculum in their school system to give them, the Europeans, uh, to the rest of the world, some semblance of being civilized. Mm -hmm. or a learned people. Mm -hmm. You see, that's the reason for, for that. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, Brother Walton, we were talking about the uh, culture of ancient Egypt, their value system, um, um, how they treated one another, uh, how they lived in relationship to um, whether they killed, whether they stole, uh, you know, in general, how they... But in your explanations, when we got to talking about the Europeans, um, you mentioned something about the land of the Bible, that Africa in ancient times had a much vaster territory, which today is called the land of the Bible. Uh, can you talk about how the Bible impacted that land or how that land was created to verify that there was a Bible. But can you speak on that? What part do you want me to speak on? Okay. You're, well, first of all, let me get at it this way. In your opinion, Brother Walter, what is your opinion about the Bible? That's the way I open this up. What is your opinion about the Bible? The Bible is a book that has no historical work whatsoever. Ninety-nine and nine-tenths of every name that's listed or spoke of in the Bible never existed as human beings, only characters. And like I mentioned to you before, they teach the Bible to the masses of people throughout the world, uh, the Christians, etc., etc., that this is the Word of God. And with the fear 
that they instill in the minds of uh, the believer about the Bible, being the Word of God, that's fear. Mm -hmm. Do not question the Bible. So they don't question the Bible. Whatever's in the Bible, whatever the Bible is saying, they take it face value and say, this is the truth. Mm -hmm. Now what the people who read the Bible and believe in these stories, they make these stories real because they use their own personal spiritual power that was given to them at the time of their birth to do that, to do just that. Mm -hmm. You see, for instance, I, in my lectures I, I give, I ask people, have you ever heard of the story of Nebuchadnezzar? They say yes. Nebuchadnezzar, the story goes, um, went into Judea in 587 B.C. And, 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 and it took the Jews out of Judea, which is Jerusalem today, and took them into Babylon. Mm -hmm. and put them into captivity there. Then it goes on to say with this story, Cyrus II, the Persian king, in, 586, uh, in, in 536, went into Babylon and freed the Jews and sent them back to Judea to build their second temple. Mm -hmm. This is what the story is being told and preached from the pulpits churches around the world. Mm -hmm. Now, if a parishioner sitting in the pews of a church takes the story in, read the story, listen to the story, if they believe that Nebuchadnezzar, that there was a Nebuchadnezzar, and that this Nebuchadnezzar in 587 went into Judea to get uh, Jews out of Judea to take them into Babylon mm -hmm. and put them into captivity, then that believer that believes the story have created a Jew in their mind uh, and created Nebuchadnezzar. Mm -hmm. And the rest of uh, the names that are attached to this story, they, they do that with their own personal spirituality. They give it light, mm -hmm. in other words. Mm -hmm. You see? Mm -hmm. So, this is how uh, the Bible, this is one way the Bible is being used. Like I said before, the Bible has no historical work because 99 and 9 tenths of every name that's listed in the Bible never existed as human beings. It is a book that's based off of mythology, fiction, allegories, and metaphors, mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera. So then one has to know some history about this Bible. Yes. You just can't go and pick up a Bible and start believing in it. Mm -hmm. See? Um, if so, then you're going to get disappointed. Um, I asked the question, when was the first Bible ever printed on planet Earth? Printed? Printed on planet Earth. I asked that question to people. I asked that question to ministers. They can't answer. I asked that question, when was the first printed Bible ever printed on planet Earth? What country was it printed in? What city in that country was it printed in? What alphabet was used to print that Bible? Mm -hmm. What material was used to formulate the printing of that Bible? Who, uh, where did this uh, material come from? Who formulated this material for the Bible to be printed? Mm -hmm. And what was the orthodox name of the Bible? Mm -hmm. Very important questions. So if an individual uh, don't have the answers for that, then they know nothing about the Bible. Okay? Mm -hmm. So, uh, <clears throat> then I asked the individual, uh, when was uh, the Old Testament, that we know that there's the Old Testament, and the New Testament put up on the one cover? Mm -hmm. They can't answer that question. Okay? Mm -hmm. uh, the third question I asked him, I said, now, in your Bible that you read, uh, who created the New Testament. Who was the first person on earth to propound and the, the creation? Compound. Propound. Okay. The, the creation of the New Testament. What was the Orthodox name? What year was it propounded? What was the Orthodox name of this propounded New Testament? How many Gospels was produced in this first New Testament ever presented on planet Earth, okay? Mm -hmm. And the writer and the creator of, uh, of the New Testament, how many 
other and more manuscript was added from this individual's writing. Uh, the fourth question I asked him, uh, when did the, the fourth gospel come into existence? Who created the fourth gospel? And what book was it put, it, put in? Etc. Etc. So if you don't know all these things, then you know nothing about the Bible. You're just sitting up in a church, mm -hmm. going along with the program. Because when you go, when an individual go to church and sit in the pews of a church, he don't have to think. He or she does not have to think. Mm -hmm. Okay. You go into a church. You sit there with, with your belief and your faith. Mm -hmm. See, and you 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 go there because. Uh, Belief and faith doesn't give you knowledge. Don't give you no knowledge. You're just sitting up there believing. Yes, going on. Yes, yes, Reverend. You see, Reverend is in the same position that you're in. Mm -hmm. See, he's a believer too. Mm -hmm. He don't know. He don't know anything about the Bible that he's preaching from. Mm -hmm. Because I, he can't answer these questions. I, I just brought forth and, and, and uh, said that this is what I ask ministers mm -hmm. and people who are going, going to bring to me about the Bible. See? Well, let me begin uh, trying to unravel some of this mystery uh, by throwing out some of the things that people believe, and perhaps you can begin to uh, give some corrections. People believe that the Old Testament was written by Moses, and um, they uh, believe that there were ancient scrolls and manuscripts which somehow was saved passed down, and in fact, uh, they believe that uh, some of these scrolls were recently uh, discovered, I think somewhere uh, in Israel, uh, not too long ago. Um, can we begin by unraveling perhaps the Moses mystery and how the Bible took its shape? Okay, now the Bible... The first five books of Moses was written by Moses, Maimonides, called uh, Maimon. Moses Maimon called Maimonides. Mm -hmm. Yes, written by Moses, but not the Moses of the Bible. Mm -hmm. That's still discrepancy. See, this is where you, this is where your knowledge of, of knowing human history comes in. Mm -hmm. You see, now. Um, uh, in 1999, uh, there was an article in the Chicago Sun Times, mm -hmm. and they were writing up an article about the Oriental Institute on the uh, campus of the University of Chicago. There's a, a museum there called the Oriental Institute. They had closed for two or three years, and they remodeled it and they opened it back up. And so they had an a, a, a article written in the Sun Times about the opening of the Oriental Institute, mm -hmm. and uh, in that same article, they had a little section in there that says little uh, known facts about Egypt. Mm -hmm. And this is what they said. They said there's, uh, even though scholars continue to search, they cannot find any evidence of a Moses being in Egypt. Mm -hmm. uh, they cannot find any evidence of Ten biblical plagues ever occurred or happening or happened in Egypt. They said that the Exodus did not happen. Very powerful. The Exodus did not happen. Find no evidence of that. And the fourth thing is said that slaves did not build the pyramid. Mm -hmm. Okay? Now, let's go back. Oh, uh, the religion called Judaism, mm -hmm. as has been stated and written and taught today, mm -hmm. that Moses created the religion called Judaism. Mm -hmm. Okay? Now, the story goes that Moses was put into a basket mm -hmm. as, a, as a baby by his mother. And she put that ba baby in the basket called Moses and uh, and it floated down the Nile River until it got uh, to Egypt and the Pharaoh's daughter, this is how the story goes now, 
Yes. Retrieved that basket and took the baby Moses out and raised the baby Moses in the house of the Pharaoh. Mm -hmm. Until baby Moses got to be an adult and he saw what the old evil Pharaoh was doing to his people, the Hebrews or the Israelites, whatever you want to call them. Mm -hmm. And there was a rebellion there. Mm -hmm. And that rebellion caused ten biblical plagues to come down on ancient Egypt by God. And that the Israelites fleeing from the Pharaoh ran to the Red Sea and the Red Sea rolled back and they was able to cross uh, on dry land into the promised land. This mm -hmm. is how the story goes now. Mm -hmm. Okay, so today they're saying, uh, Western academia is saying, and the Jews, Jewish scholars are saying, that this never happened. They didn't have no evidence of that. Mm -hmm. So therefore, without a Moses floating down an Nile River in a basket as a baby and taken out of the basket by Pharaoh's daughter, etc., etc., as the story goes, mm -hmm. uh, this makes the religion called Judaism collapse. Because mm -hmm. they don't have no, it's no Moses then you said that, that the religion called Judaism was created by Moses as a religion, then it, it is predicated on Moses floating down the Nile River, though. Mm -hmm. See, very, very key. So they say uh, Western academia and, 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 and the Jewish community are saying they have no evidence of that. Mm -hmm. Okay? So that, 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 that takes care of that. Then the Jews practice a ritualistic uh, uh, custom called the Passover every year. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The Passover is predicated on uh, 10 biblical plagues being put upon ancient Egypt and the Exodus and slaves building the pyramid. Mm -hmm. That's what it is predicated on along with Moses. Mm -hmm. So they said the uh, Western academia and Jewish community are saying there's no Moses, they have no evidence of a Moses have no evidence of no ten biblical plagues that were being uh, put upon ancient Egypt. The Exodus did not occur. Very key. The Exodus, I'm going to say it again. They said that the Exodus did not occur. Mm -hmm. And slaves did not build a pyramid. No, we wait, wait. Did not build a pyramid. Mm -hmm. So therefore, that makes the Passover invalid. Which they practice every year. It becomes invalid because you've got to have the Exodus. You've got to have uh, the Jews building the pyramid. And you got to have the ten biblical plagues coming upon ancient Egypt in order for you to have a ritualistic uh, ceremony and customs that is in the religion uh, uh, called Judaism today. They practice that every year. Mm -hmm. So they said that these things never happen, so that makes that Passover invalid. Mm -hmm. Now when you say they say, who is the they? Western academia. Now, you, that's a broad um, signature, Western academia. Okay, when you said, when you, the word Western means European. Yes. That's what that means. Mm -hmm. Academia means they're learning, they're, they're institutions. They're learning institutions. So from, from, from European learning institutions, along with, which includes uh, Jewish scholars in those institutions holding down chairs. Department. Can, you, can you name any of them? Well, you got, you take like uh, uh, Israel Finkelstein over there in, uh, in, in, in the illegal state of Israel. Uh, Ziv Herzog uh, over there in the illegal state of Israel. You got uh, William Diva uh, from Arizona State University. Uh, men like that. See? So, they're out there. Then you got S. David Sperling mm -hmm. from, from New York, who teaches at, at the Hebrew Union College in New York, who wrote a book, very important. He wrote a very important book called The Original Torah. That book was published in 2000, the year two, uh, uh, 2000. Mm -hmm. And he wrote in his book, The Original Torah, S. David Sperling, wrote in his book and said, there's no 
There's never been any Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, Sarah, Sarah, Gideon, Esau, David, Solomon, or Joshua. And he said, don't stop that. All the characters in the Bible, like I mentioned before, never existed as human beings, just biblical characters. Mm -hmm. Put it into the minds of the people, and if the people believe that that was an Abraham, then Abraham becomes alive, because you, the human being, have made Abraham alive by, by your spiritual, personal power. You see? So he is saying today that there's never been an Abraham. So if there's no Abraham, then that makes all three religions collapse. Mm -hmm. It makes Judaism collapse, Christian Christianity collapse, it makes Islam collapse. Because mm -hmm. without an Abraham, none of those religions can exist. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you are telling me that uh, Western and Jewish scholars have themselves denounced that there was, um, that these biblical characters ever existed. But, you know, I've been to Israel, uh, what, what, I've been to the land of the Bible, and they have, for an example, um, in the state of Israel, the legal state of Israel, as you call it, uh, they have the temple uh, there, uh, today, the Great Wall, the Welling Wall, they took me everywhere where Jesus walked, where, the, where he met the, uh, where he gave the Beatitudes on the mountain, they took me on the Sea of Jordan, they, everywhere in the Bible they took me. Now, uh, how does this land of the Bible come about? Explain all this, because they actually are carrying thousands of people on pyramid, all these churches, all these black preachers are carrying black people over to reinforce uh, that this white man on the cross actually lived, walked, and he's showing them where he was, where they crucified them and so forth and so on. Tell, talk about that. Well, see, that's all man-made. They made that for the people. Okay, just like Walt Disney made Disneyland for his characters, Mickey Mouse and so forth and so on. You see, so what I'm saying to you is that uh, when you go over there, it's a funny thing that you got the three major religions all housed in one area. Jerusalem, they call it Jerusalem. Okay? You got the Wailing Wall there. Now that wall, historically, was, uh, was part of a wall that when the Knights nice Templars was over there in Jerusalem, you see, in the 11th and 12th century, um, up until the 13th century, latter part of the 13th century, uh, they built a double wall city within the uh, perimeter of Jerusalem. And when, that, when, when, when the uh, Knights nice Templars was run out in 1291 by the Mamelukes of Egypt, that wall began to crumble and so forth and so on. So they made part of that and kept part of that wall, okay, for a reason. They knew that they was going to make that area the land of the Bible or a tourist attraction. They knew that. They knew that right after World War I. World War I was 1914 to 1918. So right after that, they began to, uh, they renamed that area, uh, the Middle East, which is a misnomer name. Mm -hmm. uh, they made it the land of the Bible. So that's all planned for that. Mm -hmm. Okay? So, um, uh, when you go over there, for the Christians, they got the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. Mm -hmm. Okay? For the Muslims, they got the Dome of the Rock. Mm -hmm. For the Jews, they got the, they got the Wailing Wall. All that's done on purpose. They, they went over there and began to build and put in whatever the Bible said should be over in that area. Mm -hmm. 
by way of the stories in the Bible. They created that for the attraction of these uh, believers in these various religions. That's done on purpose. Mm -hmm. Now, let, let's continue to dissect uh, this Bible. We were talking about Moses, and you said something about Moses, Maimonides, uh, and I presume you were making reference to how the book of Moses came about. Is Moses Maimonides the author of the five books of Moses? And if so, when, where, and why? Moses Maimon, called Maimonides, is the author and the creator of the first five books of Moses. How did it come about? He began to write it in 1168, and he finished it in 1180, 12 years, okay? Moses Maimon, called Maimonides, was born in Spain. And he got run out, his family got run out of Spain. And he fled into Egypt, okay? In the meantime, he was influenced by Rashi, the writings of Rashi, Solomon Bar, as they called Rashi, mm -hmm. okay? Who wrote, Rashi created um, the learned of Zion, that book, okay? Uh, between uh, 1080 and uh, 1100, mm -hmm. created uh, this book that is out today called The Learned Elders of Zion, mm -hmm. okay? And that book, written by uh, Rashi, Solomon mm -hmm. Bible, they call Rashi, because he was a rich baron in France. Mm -hmm. he was a, his family owned vineyards over there. Mm -hmm. So he created a code between other rich barons and merchants. Code? A code okay. of how to treat uh, non-barons, or how to treat the public in general, mm -hmm. who, they said, poor. Okay, how to conduct themselves, what to do, etc. Mm -hmm. See, so he created that book. Mm -hmm. And that book was also used by his grandson, Jacob Ben Mir. Okay, and then you go up to the time of Moses Maimon, which Rashi and Moses Maimon, uh, there's a hundred year difference. Rashi was born in 1040, mm -hmm. okay, died uh, 1104. Moses Maimonides was born uh, 1135 and died 1205, mm -hmm. you see? So from that book, The Learned Elders of Zion, uh, Moses Maimonides used that as a guideline. And he created uh, the first five books of Moses. This was done because uh, he knew that uh, people who began to read uh, his writing. Mm -hmm. And he uh, also put out a book called Guide to the uh, Perplex, meaning that the guide to the per perplex, meaning that after a person read his writings, they are confused. Mm -hmm. You see, because his writings were uh, was written on, for, the, for the sole purpose of being abstruse. The word abstruse means it was written for the reader or nobody to understand it. It was written on purpose for you not to understand it. The Bible is written on purpose for you and nobody else to understand, on purpose, by Moses Maimonides. See? So, that's the reason why he came out with the follow-up after writing his first five books. Guide to the perplex, to try to guide you through some of this foolishness that he written. 
Now, mind you, he went and lived for a while among the nice Templars over there in Jerusalem. That's where he uh, left his writings with, so to speak. And that's how the, his writings were able to be um, uh, used today because it was kept within the secret society of the Knights Templars until Who? a certain time in history. Who were the Knight Templars? The Knights Templars were soldiers that were a part of the army of Godfrey of de Bouillon and his brother Baldwin. Mm -hmm. uh, Godfrey of, of de Bouillon and his brother Baldwin were students of Rashid. They all came out of France. Mm -hmm. See? And um, Rashid, like I told you, it was a rich uh, vineyard, wine, uh, grape growing uh, producer in France. Mm -hmm. he, f he helped finance, or he financed the army of Godfrey and his brother Baldwin during the time of the Crusades. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So in uh, 1099, uh, Godfrey and Baldwin uh, were now uh, over there in Turkey, mm -hmm. meeting with uh, Alexius I, uh, Cominus, who was the Byzantine ruler at that time. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're talking about 1099 now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then uh, the meeting with Alexius I, Cominus, was to brief all crusading armies that came over there uh, to supposedly save uh, Christian doom, which is, goes into another history. But it was actually to save the Byzantine Empire. Mm -hmm. He said that, this is Alexis I talking to the Crusading army, and we're talking about at this time, Godfrey and his brother Baldwin. He said, whatever land that you confiscate from the Seljukian Turks, Whatever land. Whatever land. Mm -hmm. Because, see, the Seljukian Turks had erupted out of Iran in 1071 mm -hmm. uh, and, and took up a lot of land territory ruled by the Byzantine Empire mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and said, whatever land you can confiscate and, and win back, give it, to, give it back to uh, the empire, the Byzantine Empire. But that's not what they, they intended to do. So, Godfrey and his, and his brother Baldwin went into Jerusalem, conquered Jerusalem in 1099. Uh, mm -hmm. And in that crusading army of Godfrey and his brother Baldwin came out of that uh, the Knights Templars, mm -hmm. because they were soldiers mm -hmm. and part of that army. So in 1118, they began to formulate for themselves an ideology uh, and, 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 and laws and rituals that are, that are known as uh, the Knights nice Templars. And, 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 and 10 years later, uh, 1128, they got a charter for themselves and got emblems and had emblems for themselves, that compass, mm -hmm. see? Mm -hmm. Is their insignia, then a compass that they use as a insignia is also a double pyramid, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. which became the Star of David. Mm -hmm. You see, if you go to Washington D.C. and the Washington Monument, you'll find on each level in that uh, uh, monument you find knights, Templars. Uh, uh, insignias, mm -hmm. and they all lead back to the twelve tribes of Israel. See, so that's uh, a little uh, something on the on the nice Templar, without elaborating a whole lot. But that's the beginning of it. 
of the Knights Templar, they became a secret society. And they stayed over there, mm -hmm. paying what is known in history as a dehemi tax. Mm -hmm. Dehemi, D-H-I-M-M-I, -M -M -I, a dehemi tax. Because in 1187, Saladin took back to control of Jerusalem from the Knights Templar who was occupying it. Mm -hmm. See? And they, the Knights Templars had built a, a wall around Jerusalem, mm -hmm. like I mentioned before. Mm -hmm. And when uh, Saladin in 1187 took back Jerusalem, they stayed within the confines of that wall and, and did not bother anyone because they paid uh, to those Arabs, those Turks over there, a dehemi tax mm -hmm. to stay there, a real mm -hmm. estate tax. Mm -hmm. Okay? Mm -hmm. Until the Mamluks came along in 1291 and ran them out of there. Ran the Templars out? Templars out. The Mamluks ran the, the Templars The Mamluks of Egypt ran them out. Okay. You see? And they began to, to flee out of there. Mm -hmm. You see? Uh, and so, you know, they went into various places. They went into to, to Rhodes. Um, they went into Scotland. Um, and they went elsewhere along the, the, uh, the Mediterranean, those countries along uh, the Mediterranean. So you scatter. Mm -hmm. Now, Walter, uh, uh, Brother Walter, when you talk of the Knights Templars, you are talking about um, a system that was created using the Knights Templar that ultimately developed into our monetary system today and I would like for you to deal with that looking at how it developed and how it became centralized into the money controllers that we have today. Can you, can you develop the money system that, um, that we use today in terms of interest, in terms of uh, taxes and etc. Okay. Can you begin? Okay, thank you. Go ahead. Oh, we on camera? Yeah. Oh, I didn't know that. I thought you had cut it off. No. Okay. Anyway, um, to answer your question, one has to start with the lumbar. That's very key. Mm -hmm. In order to deal with any monetary conversation about money, mm -hmm. you have to start with the lumbar who came out of Germany, who originated in Germany in 543, mm -hmm. okay? And from Germany, they came into Hungary, and from Hungary, they came into the north of Italy with their leader, who was Albion, A-L-B-I-O-N. Mm -hmm. That was a leader of the Lombards. Um, the Lombards, while in Italy, began to marry into wealthy families. They began to control, eventually, uh, all of the commerce of Italy. They also began to control all of the natural resources in Italy. Okay? Now, with that being said, um, the rich monarchs, and rulers over there, they use coin money, gold and silver. Mm -hmm. uh, the Lombards changed that. They changed the money system into paper money with a usury tax, which is the word usury means a interest. Mm -hmm. Okay? They began banking as we know it today. Mm -hmm. A banking system. The mm -hmm. first bank was in Italy, mm -hmm. using paper money with a usury tax. In other words, an IOU. Well, yeah, IOU plus a tax. Yes. <laughs> Other words, that's all on your dollar, and I'm going to charge you 10% interest, and you owe me $11. See? Okay. <laughs> See? So forth and so on. So, that first bank was in, in the north of, of, of uh, Italy, 
And then they moved the banking system into France, in the mm -hmm. north of France, mm -hmm. with the usury tax. So that's, that's the beginning of your, and the foundation of the banking system or the banking industry. Mm -hmm. You have to start with the Lombards. Okay. Now, these rich monarchs who control different land territories begin to borrow money from the, from, from the Lombards, from those banks. Mm -hmm. Okay? And the rich Lombards, in order to, to pay back that money with the usury tax, with that interest on that, they begin to tax the people under their domain, under their rulership. Mm -hmm. And the tax collector for the Lombards was the Knights Templars. They were the agents. Mm -hmm. They were called the Hemi Bankers now. Mm -hmm. See? And you, as you remember, Jesse Jackson got in trouble when he called the Jews of New York Hymies, mm -hmm. or Hymie Town. Mm -hmm. See, so how do you spell the Hemi? It's D-H-I-M-M. I, if you take the D away, it's Jaime. It's Jaime. Mm -hmm. so you take the I and put a Y there, I and Y is one and the same. So that's where the Jaime comes in. So these nice Templars became uh, tax collectors for them, for the banking system. Mm -hmm. See? So that's how, but you have to start the Lombard. So today, you got the Federal Reserve still owned by the Lombards. Now, the Lombards are still operating in London, England. They have a street today in London, England. It's supposed to be the crookedest street in the world. It's called Lombard Street. That's where all your banking houses are. Mm -hmm. See? And they uh, um, uh, created the Federal Reserve in 1913. Mm -hmm. And they created the, the Bank of England in 1690. And they own uh, IMF, International Monetary Fund. They own that. They own the World Bank. You see, they got control of, of, of all your finances uh, mm -hmm. around the whole entire world. All coming from, started with the Lombards. Mm -hmm. Now, is that still today, that monetary system, controlled by the families and the descendants of the families that started it? Some of it is, yeah, I would say yes, because it was passed down from generation to generation. But now you got uh, that uh, money system and the banking system and economic system has expanded. Other families are, are in there also, mm -hmm. you see? So you got to trace uh, the other entities that's controlling the money to see where uh, that leads them by way of relationship. You take like the Rockefellers. The Rockefellers married into the Rothschild family. You see? Mm -hmm. So Rockefeller became an agent for the Rothschilds over in America, along with J.P. Morgan, mm -hmm. along with Peabody, mm -hmm. and so forth and so on. You see? Now, how do the Rothschilds fit into the original bankers? Well, they, like I said before, as time progressed, you got other people is going to accumulate a fortune, you know, like Warren Buffett. Mm -hmm. You know, if he wanted to, he could fit in that in, into that uh, program mm -hmm. of bankers, or Bill Gates and Melinda ba uh, Gates. Mm -hmm. You see, so forth and so on. So you got people, uh, you know, creating fortunes. You know, the Getty family, so forth and so on. Mm -hmm. All part of that conglomerate there. You know. But they have their own individual role to play, you know. Mm -hmm. you, got to, you got to build the birds today who uh, meet once a year mm -hmm. at the hotel called the Bilderberg Hotel in Holland. Mm -hmm. All wealthy, rich, powerful men, you see. So, but it all started, I'm trying to tell you where it started from, the origin of it. It started with the Lombards. Mm -hmm. So anybody want to study the monetary system of this world, you should have to start with the Lombards, is what I'm saying. Uh, thank you, Brother Walker. Uh, but I need to get back to uh, Maimonides and, and, and the Bible before people forget what we were talking about. Uh, Maimonides uh, wrote uh, the five books of Moses, 
in 1090? No, 1168. In 1168. And he finished it uh, 12 years later, 1180. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, how did that become uh, incorporated into the Bible in which preachers believe is the word of God? How, because uh, preachers believe that there were ancient strolls that were collected uh, and at some point these scrolls were then uh, compiled together by a uh, group of theologians uh, to determine which were um, authentic and were not, and we end up with a Bible. But can you deal with that history of how the Bible really comes about? Okay, now, <clears throat> the Bible was formulated by um, three men. I'm talking about the very beginning. Mm -hmm. Okay? Um, Johannes Rosen, R-E-A-U-C-H-L-I-N, mm -hmm. Johannes Rosen, mm -hmm. uh, Marcelo Facino, and Pico della Marandola. Now, Johannes Rosen is from Germany. And the other two, Marcello Facino and Pico della Marandola, are from Italy. Mm -hmm. They collaborated mm -hmm. using Moses Maimonides' writings that were in uh, the Knights nice Templar's possession. Mm -hmm. See? Because over there in Jerusalem, when the Knights nice Templar's lived over there, they had preceptories over there. Mm -hmm. Meaning they had different little, little, little temples over there. Mm -hmm. And those different temples were being financed by uh, rich uh, merchants uh, from Europe mm -hmm. over there. Okay, but that's a, a, a different history. But anyway, uh, these three men collaborated on the writings of uh, Moses Maimonides, thus creating what is known then as the Hebrew Bible. Mm -hmm. Okay? Now, we're talking about 1475 this happened. Mm -hmm. Okay? Mm -hmm. And um, this Bible that was created by them in 1475 using the writings of Moses Maimonides, the Roman Catholic Church had no literature for their religion called Christianity. In 1475, 30 years prior to that, the Vatican was being built for the very first time because the seat of Christianity had moved out of Constantinople, out of the Church of Hagia Sophia, that's the first seat of Christianity, out of Northeast Africa into Europe. Mm -hmm. And, and, and uh, Eugenius IV and Nicholas V and others began to build over the catacombs on the outskirts of Rome mm -hmm. by digging up all those bodies, uh, building the Vatican, building St. Peter's Church. Mm -hmm. And the Vatican is nothing but a replica of the double walled city of Constantinople. Mm -hmm. That's all it is. But getting back to the Bible, so these three men created this Bible using Maimonides' writings. And they call it the Hebrew Bible. Mm -hmm. and, and the Roman Catholic Church, like I mentioned, had no literature for their character. The character of Christianity is Jesus the Christ. They had no literature for that, or for their religion. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Ruslan, John Ruslan, told the Roman Catholic Church that this book is produced so the Christians can understand Christianity better. Mm -hmm. And the Roman Catholic Church went up into arms. Went up into arms? Arms. They was mad. They got mad. It was mad as hell. And along with this Hebrew Bible being created, Ruslan created what is known as uh, 
He created a Latin version of that same Bible because that Bible that they uh, that uh, that Ruslan and uh, Ficino, uh and Marindola had produced was in was in uh, Greek letters, mm -hmm. and they uh, Ruslan created a Bible that was in Latin, and, they, and, and, and today it's called the Latin Vulgate. But they, they, they throw you off by saying that Jerome, using the Greek Septuagint, created the, the Latin Vulgate for the Roman Catholic Church. That's historically incorrect. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It was Jerusalem creating this Hebrew Bible for the very first time along with his two Italian counterparts mm -hmm. and, and contemporaries. They, he created what is known as the Latin Vulgate for the Roman Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. Okay? Mm -hmm. So, this is how it was done. Now, um, I'll get back to the New Testament in a minute, but there, when, does Christ, when, is Christianity, when does Christianity evolve? Because you, you're saying that Christianity existed before the Bible, this Bible, was adapted by the Roman Catholic Church mm -hmm. as its instrument mm -hmm. of the focus of Jesus Christ. But uh, the Christ figure had been being worshipped before the Romans uh, in the 5th century. Perhaps maybe you can just kind of give us a rough overview of how um, it, of the involvement of, of Christianity so that we just have something to to kind of fall on. You, you have a picture there of some rapists. Can you kind of give us a, a, a rough overview of that? You don't have to spend a lot of time on it, but at least so it's connected. Okay. Now, this image that I'm showing you here it's called Serapis on there, but it looks like Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. uh, this, uh, you got to remember now, this image was created in 320 B.C. using the image of totally one Lagi, who was the successor of Alexander the Greek, who died in 323 B.C. Three years later, uh, this image was created for the successor of Alexander the Greek. Because, see, the Greeks knew and the Romans knew that in order to rule Egypt, they had to be accepted by the ancient Egyptian priest society, which was, they were rejected out of that society because the ancient Egyptians did not allow any foreigners in their sacred society. They only handpicked their own kind to come in. Okay? So, that's a very important to understand. So, uh, see, his name, the successor of Alexander the Greek, was, was named Ptolemy I Lagi, and he was called Sotar, S-O-T-E-R, which means Savior. Mm -hmm. So now, that same Savior is applied to who? Jesus the Christ today. Mm -hmm. They said, in his cult, he is spoken of as the Savior. Mm -hmm. Okay? Mm -hmm. uh, they also said in his cult, he raises the dead. That's the same, those two names, or uh, two things I just mentioned, um, are given as attributes to this Jesus Christ, the Savior and one who raises the dead. Mm -hmm. They also said that you will always be in the presence of Serapis, even after death. They said that today mm -hmm. in uh, Today, at today's funerals about this Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. So, you, uh, old Moses has gone on to, to be with Jesus. Mm -hmm. See, so even after death, it's always going to be attached to, to you. So therefore, that came out of this image. So now, if an individual will read my book mm -hmm. called The Historical Origin of Christianity, mm -hmm. I will walk you through the progression of human history of how that image came to be from Serapis, came to be Christ, and how Christianity first began. Mm -hmm. That image, what I just showed you, 
became Christ at the Council of Ephesus in 431. Mm -hmm. After the Melkite Coptic Egyptians went into uh, the ancient Egyptian divine triad mm -hmm. and took Isis out of there and created a, a creative creature called the Virgin Mary. Because the monophysites had uh, protested, saying that this Serapis had no human nature, only an Osiris-like spirit, but no human nature. So in order to, have a, uh, to be a human being, you have to be born through the body of a female. Correct. There's no way you can be, become a human being. Correct. So what they did, these Melkites went into the ancient Egyptian divine triad of Osiris, Isis, and Horus, and took Isis out of there, gave Isis, uh, gave and, uh, Isis, uh, uh, gave her components to this created creature, the Virgin Mary. Mm -hmm. Gave this Virgin Mary the attributes of Isis. And they also gave this created creature, the Virgin Mary, who was to become the mother of Serapis, mm -hmm. giving this, supposedly giving this Serapis a human nature. They attached the title of Theotokos mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to this Virgin Mary. The word Theotokos means the mother of God. Mm -hmm. So they amalgamated the two created creatures together, Serapis and the created creatures of the Virgin Mary with this created title of the Theotokos together. And now they said that after that was done, the Melkite Coptic Egyptians speaking Greek mm -hmm. said that now this is the anointed one. This is the Christos. And then Christos in English means now this is the Christ. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So 20 years later, at the Council of Chalcedon in 451, the argument was still going on whether this image had a human nature or not. In fact, that argument went on for 921 years. Mm -hmm. Okay, whether this image that we know today as Jesus Christ had a human nature or not. Mm -hmm. But if you don't study history, human history, you won't find that out. If you walk into a religion believing, that's very, very dangerous to believe in something that you know nothing about. Because belief does not give you knowledge. Faith does not give you knowledge. So you have to find these things out historically if you have to stay on the outside mm -hmm. of these various religions and other subjects to learn what's going on inside, mm -hmm. historically. Mm -hmm. So at the Council of, of Chalcedon, they tried to uh, uh, eliminate the argument between the monophysites and the diaphysitics. The monophysites, as I mentioned before, said that this Christ, now it was Christ then in 451, had no human nature but an Osiris-like spirit, but no human nature. Mm -hmm. The diaphysitics who believed in the two natures of Christ, that the word diaphysitic means one who believes in two natures of, of Christ, Osiris and a human nature. Mm -hmm. So what these Melkite Coptic Egyptians did at the Council of Chalcedon was to create two words. Persepon, which means a person. A person means a human being. And consubstantiality, mm -hmm. which is the same thing. To try to establish a human element and a human essence for the created creature that we know today as Jesus the Christ. Mm -hmm. Now this created creature, the Jesus Christ now, was created by our ancestors, Coptic Egyptians, but they was created for the Europeans. Mm -hmm. Not for us. Not for us Africans, or not for themselves. Why would they create a Christ for the Europeans and not for themselves? They don't. Who needs a Christ? Who needs something that never existed? Okay, they created this uh, Christ. First, they created Serapis, who became Christ at the Council of Ephesus, like I mentioned before. And Christianity officially began at the close of the Council of Chalcedon in 451. But they created this image that we know the day of Jesus Christ from the image of Ptolemy, one, the successor of Alexander the Greek. Why? Because the Greeks uh, wanted to be accepted by the ancient Egyptian priest society in order to rule Egypt. Mm -hmm. So they had to
be, their image had to be accepted in, in, in those temples to be uh, accepted alongside of Osiris, mm -hmm. Isis, and Horus. Mm -hmm. So that's what they wanted. So they created this image just for that purpose. I'm talking about the male kai Coptic Egyptians. Mm -hmm. You see? Did they voluntarily do that? Well, I mean, if you, you know, they, they did it for favors, like human nature. You know, if, 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 if I promise you a Cadillac, a, a big home, uh, so many thousands of dollars, you do whatever I ask you to do. And this is what was done. See? Did, did they it, do that uh, under duress? I mean, did they, uh, if, if you tell me that the ancient Egyptians were governed by Ma'atin principles, and now you're telling me that they created Serapis uh, for the European, uh, which is a distortion of their comedic uh, spirituality. Why would they do that? You got you said two key words. They practiced the Maothian Creed during the time of antiquity, which is ancient times. This is before the Europeans came into Europe now. Mm -hmm. They practiced, still practice that creed. Mm -hmm. But now once the Europeans are in there, they broke up that unity that cohesiveness that was practiced among the ancient Egyptians mm -hmm. prior to the Europeans coming in there. Once the Europeans got in there, they set up a different ball game set in place. The Europeans set up a different ball That's right. And how, how did they do that? By their presence. By, since, uh, uh, since the image of, uh, of, of, of Serapis, this image here, was not accepted by our ancestors, the ancient Egyptians, in their sacred society. Ptolemy I, Lagi, called Sota, closed all those temples down. You see? Thus cutting off the culture of our ancestors. Mm -hmm. Now, the Melchite Coptic Egyptians were Uncle Tom's of antiquity. Mm -hmm. They went along with the Greeks. You see? Mm -hmm. But the rest of, 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 of the ancient Egyptians did not. They rejected that image. Mm -hmm. Only a hand few. Mm -hmm. Okay? And they went along with the Greeks and they made, because the Greeks knew in order to rule Egypt, he had to be accepted by the priest society, the sacred mm -hmm. society. Mm -hmm. He wanted his image to be in the temples alongside of Osiris and Isis and Horus and etc., etc. Mm -hmm. But uh, they rejected this image. Mm -hmm. So Ptolemy closed all the temples down, confiscated all of their divine scroll monuments, and put it in one temple in Memphis, Egypt, where this image was created. Mm -hmm. Okay? So these male -kite Coptic Egyptians, I call the Uncle Toms of Antiquity, created for this European, this image that we know today as Jesus Christ, and created the foundation for Christianity. All that was done for the Europeans, not for themselves. Mm -hmm. Walter, can you begin to describe the changes uh, that this brought about within the uh, Egyptian worldview, the ancient Egyptian worldview? Start looking at the, the change uh, and what happened to the ancient Egyptians who refused to accept that image uh, uh, as, as a divine image. I'm looking at, at the impact of Greeks now coming into Egypt. What impact did that have on the life and the culture and the spirituality of the Egyptians and what happened to the Egyptians, the ancient Egyptians? What happened with the impact of the Europeans beginning with the Greeks, coming to Egypt, is that now you have a different people coming in with a different culture. Mm -hmm. Okay? Now, the ancient Egyptians does not have a pure ancient Egyptian culture anymore because of the mixture of other uh, people coming in, such as the Greeks and later the Romans, and the Greeks and the Romans are one and the same. So that's your first impact. 
Okay? Um, the Greeks came in, didn't use an army, didn't have to use an army. Why? Because the ancient Egyptians did not have an army to resist their onslaught of invasion. Okay? Mm -hmm. um, the ancient Egyptians had no concept of warfare. They, they were not war-like people. Our ancestors, the ancient Egyptians, were not warlike people. They were peaceful people. They were civilized people. And a highly civilized people does not dominate or kill or rape or diminish or steal and cut off other people's culture. They don't do that. So here come the Europeans in there. After Alexander came in there, then they came into Egypt in, in droves, coming out of the Balkan areas of Europe, Bulgaria, Macedonia, Yugoslavia, uh, Al uh, 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 Albania, Hungary, uh, Greece, and so forth and so on. And then they began to come out of the southern areas of Russia, Azerbaijan, Armenia, uh, Afghanistan, so forth and so on. They began so, to come into Northeast Africa. So that's how they got over there. So and you got thousands of Europeans now over a period of hundreds of years mm -hmm. pouring into Egypt because it, it offers them uh, abundance in food and civilization sets and resources. Kind of, yes, kind of deal with that. Why they would continue and how to change is now. Are they intermarrying? Um, talk to us about it. Well, let me tell you this. They also, not only did they come into Egypt and Northeast Africa and Turkey and so forth and so on, Iran and so forth, and Iraq and so forth, and Arabia, they also came uh, uh, using the Mediterranean mm -hmm. from, the, from the Balkan areas of Europe, um, as I just mentioned. They also came into the countries along North Af Africa, such as Libya, Tunisia, Algeria, Morocco, um, Mauritania, etc. Mm -hmm. You see, um, did they intermarry, marry each other? I would say no, because there was no custom for the the, the, the ancient Egyptians never uh, intermarry because they went around the world civilizing other people and meeting other people, and they never uh, intermarried those people, okay? Because it doesn't show up in their artwork, mm -hmm. okay? Uh, so I would say no. Now, of course, you're gonna have some Greeks gonna impregnate African ancient Egyptian women, you know, that's gonna happen. But so far as a mass intermarriage, no. It's not in their custom. They didn't do that. Mm -hmm. Okay. But what happened to the ancient Egyptians uh, as these Europeans are pouring in? Where did they go? The ancient Egyptians stayed over there in that area. It's called Egypt. Some of them went into different parts of Africa. Okay. Mm -hmm. But um, so, we're talking about during the time of antiquity. They went into yeah. different parts of Africa. They stayed into different parts of Africa. They lived in different parts of Africa. But still in all, um, Egypt was being occupied by these Europeans. Okay? Mm -hmm. And this is what you have to uh, begin to, to study and to begin to understand. But they did flee out of certain, uh, to two certain parts of Africa. Mm -hmm. Okay, and other parts of the world. Mm -hmm. See, the reason why I ask you is because uh, if you look at the Sudan, the, the Sudan continued uh, to build pyramids after pyramid building had ceased in the ancient Nile Valley area of the around the Mediterranean, where the Great Pyramids are, and around there. But in the Sudan, which is further south they continued to build pyramids and if you look at uh, Ethiopia the rock hewn churches which I like would, would like for you to speak about 
you see a tremendous uh, building uh, like nothing else in the world where they built these temples down into the ground. But very little seems to be known about when those temples were built uh, and exactly why because they are uh, looked at today as Christian churches. But uh, I don't think that's correct and I wanted to get your opinion of those rock hewn churches uh, over there in Ethiopia, what period, who the people were that built them and for what purpose. Okay, now, like I mentioned before, uh, going on with your questions, you asked me what happened uh, once the Greeks got into Egypt, where did the, 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 uh, uh, a lot of the ancient Egyptians go? Again, a lot of them stayed in Egypt and they went to other parts of Africa including the other parts of Africa being the Sudan and being Ethiopia. Mm -hmm. Okay? So, and, that it, and they went into northern, the northern part of Africa also, all those countries named uh, along the, the Mediterranean, which is called North Africa, Libya, Tunisia, Algeria, Morocco, and so forth and so on. So they went in, in, in that direction. They also went into uh, Turkey, um, into Northeast Africa, um, into Arabia, what, is, what we know today as Arabia, Syria, what we know today as Syria, and uh, up in, in Iran, what we know today as Iran, and so, so forth and so on. Now, getting to Ethiopia, this is something that people, and about those churches, this is something that uh, people, uh, especially our, our, our scholars of, of African um, descendants talking about Ethiopia and they think that Christianity started with the Coptic Ethiopian Christians. No, it didn't. Okay? Uh, if you get my book, Historical Origin of, uh, of Christianity, I'll walk you through the progression of history of how Christianity actually started. Mm -hmm. But getting back to Ethiopia, the first known European some of our way of history, the first known European to come into Ethiopia, which was called Abyssinia at the time, mm -hmm. was James Bruce, a Scotchman. Mm -hmm. He came in there uh, looking for the source of the Nile. Yes. Okay? And he wrote five uh, volumes titled To Discover the source of the Nile. This is, he was over there in the 1780s. Mm -hmm. And in 1790, he wrote these five volumes to discover the, the source of the Nile. So I would say that James Bruce was the first European to go into um, Abyssinia, known as Ethiopia, in the 1780s. Mm -hmm. Also, it's also known historically that the Europeans did not begin to come into Ethiopia until uh, the 19th century. The 19th century, okay? And that those Ethiopians at that time were not Christians. Christianity was not practiced in Ethiopia. Christianity was not practiced nowhere in Africa but in the city, double walled city of Constantinople at the very first Christian church ever built mm -hmm. called the Hagia Sophia, which Justinian and his wife built that church, uh, caused it to be built by African architects and African builders in 532, and they finished it five years later, 537. Mm -hmm. And my wife, in my book, The Historical Origin of Islam, writes about that church. What happened to the church of Hagia Sophia? Mm -hmm. A very important chapter. Now, I, I encourage everyone who's listening and looking at this video to get my book, The Historical Origin of Islam and also The Historical Origin of Christianity. Now, uh, 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 so therefore, uh, in Ethiopia, the Europeans began to come in there in the 19th century. In the latter part 
of the 18th century, I told you the first known European came in there was James Bruce, mm -hmm. who was looking for the source of the Nile. Mm -hmm. And he came into Ethiopia, and at that time, it was called Abyssinia, and the, uh, the, the capital of Abyssinia was Gondar, G-O-N-D-A-R. Correct. Okay? And uh, he uh, poked around in there, and he left, and he went back into Scotland. He was a Scotchman. And he wrote this five-volume book called To Discover the Source of the Now. Now, who began to bring Christianity in, into Ethiopia? That's the, that's the question. And this is where we need to focus, and I will bring, I'll try to share some light on that. Okay. Um, it was the Church of England in um, 1799, mm -hmm. the Church of England uh, created what is known as the uh, CMS, Church Missionary Society. Mm -hmm. In 1809, 10 years later, they created a society to a Christian society to, to teach non-Christian countries Christianity. Mm -hmm. Okay, very key. That's 17... Uh, 1809. 1809. 1799, the Church of England created uh, a missionary society. Mm -hmm. CMS, Church Missionary Society, mm -hmm. in 1799. Ten years later, in 1809, they created a Christian society to teach non-Christian countries Christianity. Now, uh, Walter, I, I just want to interrupt and ask you, why was it necessary for other countries, outsiders, to convert people to their way of, uh, to their religion or their way of life? Uh, what's the purpose of it? To control the people, to control humanity. See, when a person is a Christian or embraces any type of religion, you become uh, enslaved with that religion. That re religion enslaves you, puts you in, 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 into bondage, because all religions have laws, customs, rituals, and ceremonies for you to abide by. Mm -hmm. You know, so you take it like the Muslim. Uh, you got Muslims out there praying five times a day with hickeys on their head. Mm -hmm. Okay? That person's in bondage. He's not free. Mm -hmm. People, go, uh, Christians go to church, take up communion, take up mass, go to, go to uh, Roman Catholic Church and, and, and take mass uh, uh, ceremonies, practice, you know, mass and so forth and so on. That's, a, that's bondage. Mm -hmm. You see, Not so only that, you're predictable and by following the traditions and the rules and regulations of that uh, religion, mm -hmm. you're put under the domination of the head of that religion. Correct. So we that they control you through that religion. Correct. That's just like, I'm glad you brought that up, that's just like this, this little boy here. Okay. He's in control, or under the control of Christianity. And he's also under control of this image. See? And I'm going to read you what it says there. Mm -hmm. It says, at a church in Brooklyn, Brooklyn, New York, a solitary boy communes with his God. Now, who is his God? Look up there and see who his God is. It's a white image. And look at him. He's an, he's, he's an African young man born in America. Mm -hmm. Okay? A descendant of the ancient Egyptians. He doesn't know that. Mm -hmm. But he is communing with his God. His God is a white man. Okay? And that God that he's worshiping and giving all of his power away, the power that was given to him at the time of his birth is now being given away to this image. Mm -hmm. Okay? That makes him powerless. Mm -hmm. Okay? And this image that he is, is, is worshiping don't even look like him or any member of his family. Mm -hmm. It's a disgrace. And the enemy 
in our African community, in America, and throughout the world, is the minister. Mm -hmm. Where this young man goes to church, his minister encourages him to bow down to an image, a dead white man on the cross that don't even look like him. Mm -hmm. And bow down to and give all his power away mm -hmm. to this image. Mm -hmm. Thus making him powerless. Every time an individual goes sit, sitting in a, in a pew of a church, mm -hmm. he gives all of his power away. Mm -hmm. Now, that also was used to enslave the African continent during the uh, invasion of Africa by Europeans. Missionaries came to pave the way. Well, of course. This, this is what I was beginning to tell you, how it all began with the missionaries. Mm -hmm. It started with the Church of England. Mm -hmm. You see? Going back, 1799, they created a church missionary society, CMS. Mm -hmm. Ten years later, they created a Christian uh, society to teach Christianity to all non-Christian countries mm -hmm. with the missionaries. Mm -hmm. This was done in 1809. Mm -hmm. Okay? There was no Europeans. Uh, there's no history of a European in Ethiopia or the Sudan. Wow. The Europeans, even the Byzantine rulers and the Ottoman Turkish rulers, did not come that far south because there was no, they were landlocked. Mm -hmm. See, they stayed along the Mediterranean. Well, let me ask you, I just want to throw this in. What was the territory boundaries of the Greek and Roman rule of, of ancient Egyptian and in North Africa. I, I gave that to you. Okay, you did. I already gave it to you. Uh, I told you uh, uh, the, the, the Byzantine rulers, okay, which is under the Roman rulers, and the Byzantine Empire was started by Constantine in 430 by going into a Northeast Africa, into a city called Byzantium. Mm -hmm. Turning that city of Byzantium and renaming it Constantinople. Mm -hmm. Today, Constantinople is known as Istanbul, Turkey. Mm -hmm. Okay? And uh, that Byzantine Empire and rulers controlled all of North Africa, all those countries along North Africa, Egypt. Mm -hmm. um, they went into Northeast Africa, Turkey, Saudi Arabia. It was no Iraq then. Iraq wasn't created until 1920 mm -hmm. under, under, under the British. And they was given a mandate by the, by the League of Nations in 1920 after World War I. And they boarded off a portion of Iraq, I'm sorry, a portion of I Arabia to make Iraq. Mm -hmm. And they also boarded off Iraq to make Kuwait. In other words, to break up that oil reserves over there. Mm -hmm. Okay? And then you got Iran. Iran, uh, uh, Afghanistan borders Iran. Mm -hmm. See? And then um, you got Yemen, which is further south of Northeast Africa. And then you got Syria. Mm -hmm. um, and then in 1922, under the mandate given to the French by the League of Nations, they